Well, good evening, and thanks for coming out for the first lecture of the winter quarter. Our keynote speaker this night uh, is Jim Andelman, and he is a co-founder and general partner of Rincon Venture Partners, and has more than 15 yeah, years of experience in venture capital investing, worry, technology investment banking and advisory services, and strategic business consulting. Uh, before Rincon Venture Partners, he served as a principal at uh, Broadview Capital Partners, where he led the assessment of over 300 um, investment opportunities, participate participated in the deployment of 78 million over uh, five portfolio companies. Uh, he received his MBA from the Amos Tech School at Dartmouth and his BS in economics at Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. So please join me in welcoming Jim Andelman. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for coming out. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are obligated to be here because you're in that course? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's a good number. Um, well, thank you uh, for coming, even though you had to, and thanks of, uh, for those of you who didn't have to for coming. Uh, Rincon Venture Partners is an early stage venture capital firm uh, focused on Southern California, based here in Santa Barbara. Uh, we've been up and running for about two years, uh, and we have uh, six portfolio companies. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, high level venture capital industry, there's, uh, there's some rumblings about, uh, and there have been for the last two years, uh, questions since the bubble burst in 2000, really, as to whether the venture capital industry uh, is still a viable one, whether this asset class returns, uh, has the returns that justify the cost and the risk. Um, the this pitch presumes a, sorry, this presentation presumes a certain level of knowledge about the VC industry. Um, I'm happy to make this interactive, so if anyone has questions, and for the sake of TV, I'll repeat them uh, so we don't have to shoot the mic around uh, along the way, so you don't have to wait till the end. So some quotes. Uh, Seven Rosen Funds, one of the sort of most established uh, VC funds in the country. It's been around for 25 years. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually disbanding this year. Uh, last year, they sent a note to, they raised uh, 250 million towards a $300 million goal at a new uh, fund, their 10th fund. Uh, and they sent a letter out to, their new, to these investors, uh, essentially saying, we were returning all your commitments. Uh, we think the traditional venture capital model is broken. Essentially, there's too much capital chasing too few deals. Uh, there's a terribly weak exit environment. And we don't think it's responsible to take your money because we don't think the returns are going to be there. So this is a big deal. These are, these are guys that do this for a living and have done this for a living for their whole lives uh, and are you know, one of uh, 850 or so venture capital firms in this country. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a big deal to publicly announce that they think their industry is, is essentially not worth existing. Um, so let's look at some of the, the stats behind that. Uh, traditionally, over the long term, so these are 20-year and 10-year investment horizons, uh, ending the most recent data I could get was ending 630.07, so middle of last year. Uh, over the long term, so 20 years and 10 years, early stage VC uh, has had superior returns compared to other equity-based asset classes. Uh, the things along the bottom there, early stage VC, so that's investing at companies you know, closer to the point of startup. Later stage VC, so that's expansion stage financing. That's what I used to do in my last fund. Essentially, think of that as businesses that you know, might have 5 to 20 million in revenue, uh, but still have a burn rate on their way to, to uh, bigger and bigger things, IPOs or M&A. Uh, the next one is buyout. Uh, that is also, venture capital and buyout are both lumped into this asset class called private equity. VC and buyout don't from a practitioner's perspective, don't have all that much to do with each other, but they both uh, get money from the same investor base, uh, and they're both considered an alternative asset because it's an illiquid security in a fund that has a similar um, structure. Um, so you can see buyout is next, and then NASDAQ and S&P 500. And if you look at the 20 year, the longest term, you know, it goes down linearly, and that makes sense. The things at the over here are the highest risk, the things over there are the lowest risk. So that sort of you know, supports fundamental economic theory uh, that says higher risk uh, commands higher returns. Um, 
But does that advantage, you know, how's it been doing lately? If you shorten the time horizon, you look at five years and one year, that advantage isn't there. Particularly in the five-year stage, you'll notice that the 10-year uh, early stage VC really, really does great. And that's because uh, some really phenomenal returns during the bubble years. What you have in the five-year, which goes back to 02, is uh, you get the nadir, but not the apex. Uh, and so uh, returns have been particularly bad since that bust. Uh, and then the one-year returns are better, but still below those other asset classes. So uh, a couple of caveats. One is uh, private equity, both venture capital and buyout, uh, are hard to track because they don't have to report results. Uh, the only people we have to report results to are our investors who are you know, private individuals, family offices, institutions. So it's not like you can go to the newspaper and look up a stock price. Uh, so there are very imperfect uh, mechanisms for collecting this data, but these at least are collected consistently and, uh, and are generally accepted as the best we got in the industry. Now, uh, you know, another, uh, the, another reason this picture might not be so bleak uh, is that for apples to apples comparison, the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 numbers there are uh, one year return ending 6.30.07. Uh, second half of 07 was pretty crappy for the public markets. If you actually do one year return ending yesterday, both of those numbers are negative, And therefore, all of the uh, alternative asset classes start to look not so bad. So the one argument was that, uh, you know, so this is fundamentally this bottom line, these returns. The only way that a venture capital investment uh, provides a return is through an exit. So that means we put money into companies, we help them grow, and then they either sell to a larger company or they go public and we can sell shares on, a, on, a, on the public markets. So it's very important to look at exits to understand what's going on, what's driving these returns. So what we have here are venture-backed exits from 91 through the nine months ending uh, September 07. The blue are IPO exits, exits by IPO of venture-backed companies, and the red are exits by M&A of venture-backed companies. And what you see is the total number, take that nine month number at the end and you know, multiply it by 1.25, add another sort of third of that block on top of it to extrapolate up to the full year. And, you know, you see there are no fundamental downward trends uh, in, in unit count, the number of companies that are exiting. What you do see is a pretty fundamental uh, uh, change in IPO prospects. You know, so this stuff right here is before the bubble, majority of venture-backed companies that had an exit had an exit through an IPO. Uh, during the bubble times, it was roughly 50-50. And since then, uh, especially with the implementation of Sarbanes-Oxley, which makes it harder to be a public company, basically, uh, especially harder to be a small public company, uh, the IPO markets are de minimis. Uh, so the, the, the main mechanism for uh, liquidity in venture capital uh, is M&A, uh, selling, selling these companies to larger companies. So, so far, we're not seeing such a bleak picture. Um, you know, returns aren't great, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not in the basement. Uh, and it looks like, gee, there's decent exit volume. Um, if you look at the, uh, the assertion that there's too much money chasing too few deals, what you see here is money deployed by VC funds. So, you know, taking out those, the crazy years of the dot-com, uh, 99, 2000, 2001, uh, you see a reasonably consistent picture around $20, 20 billion dollars is what that is being deployed. That means money that VC funds are investing into companies each year. Another way to look at this, oh, sorry. Uh, so what's the problem? So here's the problem. Uh, the average VC-backed exit these days, the average M&A VC-backed exit is around 60 million bucks. Uh, so that means these companies are selling on average for 60 million dollars. The number, which we had on a couple slides ago, uh, shows about 400 exits in a year. Uh, smaller ones don't get disclosed. That's, those are those with the disclosed value. 
So sort of by best estimates, there are maybe 600. You increase that by 50%. So 60 million times 600 companies, that means there was $36 billion in uh, value to stockholders of these, com of these venture-backed companies that sold. VCs don't own 100% of the company. Entrepreneurs own some of it. Angels own some of it. Some money has to go to the employees. Some money has to go to debt holders. So if you conservatively assume that half of that money went to the VC investors, that means each year $18 billion flows to the venture capital coffers. But we just saw that 20 plus billion is going out. So that means that, uh, that the money coming back to these venture capital firms is less than the money that they're deploying. That's a problem. You do that for too long, your investors are going to stop giving you money. So what's behind that? What's, you know, 60 million sounds like a pretty good number. So how come that doesn't work? Um, I assert that a big part of the problems is, is, uh, is what's called agency issues. Agency issues are when the people making the decisions have ulterior motives. That's a short version for that. It's, it's more typically assigned to folks like investment bankers you know, who only get paid when a transaction closes. So therefore, they're pretty motivated to make sure a transaction closes, whether it's the right thing for the company or not. Um, uh, here I talk about the conventional 2 and 20. That basically defines the economics of a venture capital fund. And what it means is uh, a venture capital firm raises a fund, which means they get commitment f commitments from investors uh, to give them that much money, which they go and then invest over uh, typically a five-year period. Uh, and then they have another five years to sort of manage and build the portfolio and exit those companies. The two in the two and 20 is a 2% management fee. It's just like a management fee you pay on a mutual fund. It pays to keep the business open. Uh, it pays for the operating budget for the firm. Uh, and what that is is it's 2% of committed capital a year. That's typical. For smaller funds, it's 25 But in general, 2 is a good, good benchmark. 20 is... Uh, the way that the managers of a venture capital fund share in the upside in the investment returns. Uh, specifically, the general partner, which is the, the group of managers of the fund, it's me, uh, get 20% of excess returns. So after we get our investors' money back to them, anything above that, they get 80%, we get 20%. So let's take two scenarios. The first set of bullets is a $50 million fund with three partners. So $50 million fund, 2% a year, you have a two, $1 million annual operating budget. So for three partners, uh, you, know, you take out the operating expenses like rent and travel and lawyers and things like that. Maybe you get 200 k a year W-2 income. And then if, you, if the fund does a 5x, which is industry-leading returns over the entire fund, uh, that means out of your 50 million, you've got 250 million dollars in value. Uh, the portion, the 20 percent of that that goes to the partnership is 40 million bucks. So again, for each partner, if you've got three partners over the life of a fund, which is 10 years, that's 13 million bucks. That's pretty darn good. Uh, and what it means to the investor, after the partners take their bit, they get 4x on their money. And that equates to roughly a 25% net IRR, which is pretty good compared to long-term returns in the public markets of around 12%. So it's a pretty nice risk premium. Now let's look at a billion-dollar fund with eight partners. They have a $20 million annual operating budget. And if they only get a 2x instead of a 5x, there's $200 million that goes to the partners. That's just the math. So what does this mean to the partner? An individual partner at this eight-person firm gets $2 million a year W-2 income and $25 million worth of carry over the life of the fund. That seems better than the first one. The problem is, from the investor point of view, that after they took their bid on the 2x, it's a 1.8x at best. And what that equates to is an 8% IRR, which is below what you'd get if you put it in the S&P 500. So by agency issue, I mean there's a fundamental conflict of interest. A venture capital firm manager is interested in having more capital under management, whereas that is not necessarily to the benefit of the investor. So here's some evidence. 
This, is, this chart shows the percent of new funds raised in a given year that were under $100 million in total size. This is nominal, and 2007 was the lowest in nominal terms since 1992. So if you look at real dollars, assuming you know, a, a modest inflation rate, it might be the lowest it's been since the, since the formation of this industry. So the, the, the small fund is essentially an endangered species. What does this drive? I call this partner deal math. It's actually worse than what I just described because uh, successful funds that can raise, successful firms that can raise bigger funds typically have overlapping funds. I mentioned that a fund has a 10-year life. You typically invest money in the first five years or so. You're allowed to go and raise a new fund once, you're, once the fund you're working on is 70% deployed. So that's typically for funds that you know, are successful in the three or four year range. So you might have up to you know, two, three, even four funds concurrently under management where you have uh, money from those funds that you're managing. Uh, I, sorry, that's a placeholder for me that uh, the, there's, a, there's a statistic on there from Bain Capital Ventures. Uh, what this means is that time is the new constrained resource. You know, yes, capital dollars are precious, but I've actually got a lot per individual partner. Uh, and this is a pretty good metric to think about, this capital under management per partner. That says me as an individual, how much money do I have to put to work? And in this scenario, it's typically around 100 million bucks, even for, quote, early stage venture capital firms. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, for these firms, it's sort of a badge of honor to say how much capital under management you have. So you'll see an early stage capital firm, a venture capital firm that says they have you know, $1.2 billion under management and they've got six partners. So do the math and figure out how much each one has to be responsible for putting to work. Uh, venture capitalists are active investors, active supportive investors. We sit on the boards of our companies. Uh, we have, we're, our job is to help them succeed. So an individual partner is pretty much maxed out if they have 10 portfolio companies. It's rare for a partner at a venture capital firm to have that many portfolio companies at once. Typically, it's you know, six, but it's up to 12 in some scenarios for you know, these types of true, active, early stage quote, uh, portfolio companies. So what that means is you're putting $10 million per company on average, which is sort of a big number. And you're not typically doing it by yourself, right? If you're putting 10 million in and you have co-investors, company has three rounds of financing, you like to have an outside lead for each one so that an objective third party can set the price. Uh, you know, a typical venture-backed company might have 30 to $40 million in it when all is said and done. So that $60 million exit isn't start, is starting to not look so good when you've only given away a portion of your business and you've raised 30 or 40 million. Hold on. We are. Sorry about that. It jumped slides. So I'm going to do it in this mode. Make sure we don't do that again. Uh, and here's some evidence of that. So this is investment deployments by stage. Uh, the white is late stage. The gray is called expansion stage. And I think these are defined by revenue thresholds. So seed is basically uh, you know, to incorporate, no product yet. Early stage is initial traction. Expansion stage is in revenue. And later stage is growth equity. And you can see the blue bar, which is the early stage, is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, less and less available. More people are doing that later stage stuff because you can justify putting larger chunks of money into bigger later stage companies. So these are the broad effects. Shift to later stage, less money available for early stage, more money available for late stage. Overcapitalization. If I need to put 10 million bucks to work in this company, uh, and I like the company, I'll put 10 million bucks in the company. Uh, and most entrepreneurs aren't going to turn it down just because they don't need it. Uh, but it has some, it has some uh, some negative effects even to the entrepreneurs. It sounds good. And uh, you know, it, it, I had this happen at one of my portfolio companies. The company went out to raise 10 million bucks. Uh, a group of investors wanted to put in 30 million. And we said, well, we don't need 30 million. And we don't want to suffer the dilution that taking in 30 million would 
entail, right? So at a given valuation, the more money you take in, the more of your company you have to give away to the new investors. So they said, well, yeah, we understand that. We understand that you, you want to avoid the dilution. Tell you what, we'll, we'll bump up the valuation to offset that. So that sounds great for the entrepreneur. Uh, it's kind of lousy for the investor who's put money into the venture capital firm because these guys are going out paying higher values than they have to just so they can cram more money into the companies. As companies develop and move toward exit, this can have really negative effects because a modest outcome that might be a big win for an entrepreneur, right? If an entrepreneur owns 20% of the company uh, and, uh, and there's an opportunity to sell the company for $40 million, that's $8 million to him. That's pretty good. Uh, that would be considered a win for most individual entrepreneurs. But if you've taken in $30 million and your last valuation was $80 million, there's no way that the members of your board of directors who get to decide whether a certain M&A transaction, a certain exit is OK, there's no way they're going to approve that because they lose money. So why not keep operating the business and shoot for a bigger exit? And oh, by the way, you still have a burn rate because you took in all this money, so they want you to go and spend it. Uh, and so your company is, not, is still at risk. It's not assured that you'll be successful in the future. So oftentimes, companies have to forego a sure thing that is a pretty good outcome for the entrepreneur because they took a lot of money at a high valuation. And then the other broad effect is this convergence of investment focus. Uh, you have more funds that are bigger targeting the same types of companies that can consume a lot of capital uh, in the same stage of their development. And therefore, you have a more competitive environment. In Economics 101, efficient markets drive excess profits to zero. And if you have a highly competitive market, uh, basic economic theory says you know, marginal price moves to marginal cost and there are zero economic profits. And that's sort of what happen what's happening on Sand Hill Road. So what's the solution? I would assert that. Uh, you know, coming, coming back to this slide right here, this is the fundamental problem. Uh, venture capital firms have success. It enables them to raise a bigger fund, so they do. Because the economics to the individual partner are superior, even if it's not so great for the industry, even if it's not so good for that firm's investors. Um, the shocking thing is that those investors that I talk about are, by and large, in this industry, large institutional investors. Uh, the world's largest uh, backer of venture capital funds is CalPERS, uh, which is the California Public Employees uh, Pension System. Uh, CalSTRS, which is for teachers, is another big one. University endowments like Harvard and Yale are other big ones. They have a lot of capital under management. It's a lot easier to deploy, for them to deploy their capital in bigger chunks, have a smaller number of relationships with VCs, a smaller number of VCs that they have to keep track of. Right? This math that I talked about right here you know, applies to them also. They can only keep track of so many uh, venture capital firms in their portfolio. So it's easier if you put more money with fewer of them. So what's the answer? I assert it's pretty simple. The answer is this first line, uh, where you have a smaller fund, lower capital under management per partner, can deploy capital in smaller bite sizes, uh, and still win with that $60 million exit. So this is what we're doing at Rincon. Uh, our average initial investment is $500,000 to $1.5 million, as opposed to, uh, and we expect over the life of a portfolio company, we'll put in maybe, uh, maybe $2 to $3 million. 
as opposed to that 10 or that 20. Uh, and we have a, a bunch of strategies that we think mitigates risk, reduces that downside. Uh, we invest at or near the point of initial commercialization. A big reason that early stage investments fail is because the company was never able to bring the, mark, the product to market that they sought to. It was a science project, and they spent a whole lot of money, and they couldn't get there. So we seek to avoid that. Uh, we look for companies that, are, that have a product already that's ready for market, uh, has some early adopters who are uh, uh, big advocates that can serve as proxies for market acceptance. Uh, we focus on an underserved geography. Um, you're all here in Southern California. Southern California is a phenomenal place for entrepreneurship right now. Um, the sort of the macro trends that are driving success for startups really favor Southern California. Uh, digital media is probably uh, one of the largest, you know, largest upswings in terms of venture, ca venture capital dollars and, uh, and realizations. Companies like MySpace, Southern California. Um, when I talk about the supply-demand imbalance, here's an interesting statistic. Uh, these are the four largest markets for VC in the United States. Um, Silicon Valley is the largest. Southern California. New England had traditionally been the second largest. Southern California just passed it, and New York, Metro New York's the third. What this chart shows is the dollars received by in-region companies. So that means how much money did Southern California, as Southern California as an example, how much money did Southern California startups take in from venture capital firms, divided by the amount of money deployed by venture capital firms in that particular region. So that says Southern California startups took in three times as much money as Southern California VCs put to work in companies. Uh, by contrast, Silicon Valley and New, Engl and New England are roughly on par. So that means, that means about as much money was deployed by local firms as was taken in by local companies. Now again, in New York, you'd expect it's a money center, so you have firms there that are putting money to work all over the place. So that's about at 50%. So what this means is there's, there's just a lot of opportunity locally. Uh, and in fact, you'd be shocked to learn that of all that money taken in by Southern California companies, 54% of it was, was from Silicon Valley firms, and only 15% of it was from Southern California firms. So because we do early stage, companies sort of need a little more guidance, need a little more help. They're less fully formed. Uh, there's tremendous value to being a local investor. You tap your network to help them with basic tactical blocking and tackling, finding an accountant, finding a lawyer, uh, recruiting execs, recruiting even junior people. Um, so we see a great opportunity relative to the capital base here. And this imbalance is growing rather than getting smaller. As like I said, the money is getting concentrated on Sand Hill Road in, in, uh, in those firms. By the way, you know, there are 360 or so venture capital firms in the Bay Area as compared to something like 45 down in Southern California in a much larger geography. That's here all the way through San Diego. Um, and startups are becoming more dispersed. You know, most, many, many of the startups are internet companies. Uh, if, you're, if you're on the internet, you can be anywhere uh, and serve the globe, which is very exciting. Uh, we typically invest after a seed round. Um, seed is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, seed basically means, you know, it's a guy with an idea doesn't have a business, maybe has a partner, isn't incorporated yet, and you know, needs some money to get a lawyer and incorporate. Uh, that remains the purview, for the most part, of individuals, friends and family, angels, founders themselves. Um, the good news is that angels are getting more sophisticated, especially up in the Bay Area. Um, this gap that I described is to some degree being taken up by what I would call super angels, which are, you know, uh, tech executives, executive entrepreneurs in the sectors that we are talking about that have had success in the past that put their own money to work. Uh, that is less prevalent in Southern California. What Southern California does have is organized angel networks. 
uh, like Tech Coast Angels and Pasadena Angels. Tech Coast Angels is the nation's largest angel network uh, made up of over 100 individuals uh, with chapters from here, Westlake Santa Barbara, all the way down to San Diego, uh, which is good news. Uh, the bad news is that they start to act a little bit like an institution because they're so big uh, and because their processes are so formalized. So getting money from them is almost the same uh, in terms of the process that you have to go through uh, for getting it from uh, a VC firm like mine. Uh, we target median pre-money valuation under five million bucks. Uh, the pre-money valuation determines how much the venture capital firm gets of the company for the money they're putting in. Uh, one thing to keep in mind when you do this math is VCs typically put in what's called primary shares. So it's new money that's going into the company, new shares are being created, the money goes onto the balance sheet of the, of the company, and they use that to fund growth. As opposed to what I would call secondary shares, which is that buyout world, where you're buying somebody out, you're buying shares from somebody that already exists, and it's a transfer of ownership, as opposed to expanding the size of the pie. By targeting low pre-money valuations, we reduce that valuation risk, so that that $60 million exit looks, starts to look pretty good if our, if our pre-money valuation is below five million bucks. Again, industry-leading returns, even if we get what's considered sort of a ho-hum exit uh, in this industry. Uh, and then finally, we target businesses with low total capital requirements. Uh, there is an early stage strategy uh, that is not uncommon uh, that considers the role of the early stage investor to be a feeder to the big, the big uh, Bay Area firms and the big firms in other places that do those $20 million follow-on financings. Um, the idea is, you know, give them enough, give them a couple of months of runway to sort of prove the model, build it up, and then hand it off to, to a guy who can, uh, who can really make it hum. The challenge with that is that if you're a small firm uh, and you establish a burn rate that puts you on the trajectory that can support a $20 million financing, justify it, and that financing doesn't come or is too slow to come, then what do you do? You can't support that burn rate yourself. Uh, and so those, you know, those companies have, uh, have a severe risk of imploding. And also, then you're subject to those same uh, dynamics that I described previously, where it's sort of that uh, swing for the fences, go big or go home, uh, and, uh, and there just aren't that many hits out of the park these days. So uh, the goal is to you know, invest in companies where uh, we and our investment partners at the outset can support the company for a good long time to ensure that they don't hit a wall you know, driving 80 miles an hour. So essentially what we think, and you know, this, is, this, is, uh, this is an experiment that's in process. Uh, like I said, we've, you know, we've been investing for just two years, which is a short time period in this world. Uh, six portfolio companies out of a total eventual of something like, uh, like 20. Uh, but we think downside is mitigated without sacrificing upside. This is sort of anathema to the VC vernacular uh, that says, you know, you invest in 10 companies, Seven of them go out of business, two of them get your money back, and there's one big home run that makes up for all, the, all those dogs in that portfolio. Um, the problem with that is that, well, there's a bunch of problems with that. One, uh, I was an expansion stage VC in the Bay Area during the, the bubble bust. And what I learned there is that the companies that are going to go down don't typically go down quietly. Uh, and, uh, and they consume a lot of your time and energy, even if they're going to go down anyway. Uh, and you know the, there are there are very good entrepreneurs who fail. Uh, it's it it comes with the territory, and as an active supportive investor, you don't just want to abandon them if you th see things starting to turn south. You want to spend time to try and help them, try and turn it around. Uh, you know, try and uh, what we call in the industry is uh, execute a kick save, um, and that takes a lot of time, and. Uh, and it's time that has a, a potentially a low return, uh, whereas a VC's time might be better spent helping the ones that are going to make it be that much more successful. Um, so our hope is that uh, you know, out of every 10, you know, I would love for none of our companies to fail. 
It's probably unrealistic, but I expect, uh, uh, I hope and expect that a small proportion of them will. Uh, and, uh, and that just avoids those, those unpleasant experiences of having to shut companies down. Um, that's about what I have for the formal presentation. Um, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on this, people's questions about it. Um, in the back. If you're the venture capital firm, and that's the market rate, why would you? With competition, uh, uh, maybe investors are going to demand that it's less. Uh, that is a reasonable hypothesis, um, and it hasn't happened. Uh, even the that buyout um, category I described, uh, to give you a, a sense of context, um, the VC annual dollars from, from their investors, from the limited partners, is about $20 billion a year. Last year in buyout, it was $200 billion. Uh, these are the KKRs, the Blackstones, uh, uh, the Thomas Lees of the world that have multi-billion dollar funds. A billion dollar fund in the buyout world is a, is a, is a middle market fund. It's, it's flabbergasting. Uh, you know, their management fee might be one and a half percent. So think about if you've got a ten billion dollar fund, what your management fee is. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the investors pay it. Um, there, uh, I had a, a friend who recently departed a, a well-known Southern California venture capital firm. Uh, not a huge one. They're, they've got, uh, they're on their fourth fund. 250 million under uh, 250 million dollar fund size was the last one. He made two and a half million dollars a year W-2 income. Uh, he after he left, he confided to me that the job there was to not screw it up. Right? We've got a good deal here. We've got institutions that are going to sign up for our next four funds, so long as we don't screw it up. So let's just not look stupid. There was not a mentality. There was not an orientation toward equity return. There was an orientation toward keeping the boat afloat, keeping it sh sailing in the, in the direction that it was sailing. That's why I was saying, like, if you don't have the annual just income and it's only you get it at the end when, when you get a buyout, yeah. that would probably, as an investor, Right. But the good funds, the, 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 so, you know, interestingly, there is a... Uh, there's an unusual dynamic in this industry. Um, it's very hard to be a first-time fund. It's, if you have a track record of multiple fund success with a team, uh, you have very good prospects of raising your next fund. Uh, and there's a, even though there are questions about the, you know, sort of the, as I'm describing, the viability of this asset class, for the name brand funds, there's a line at the door. Uh, you wouldn't expect it to be the case, but it, but it is. And part of it is because uh, the public markets have been pretty good for the last you know, 20 years. Uh, and these asset classes have been pretty good for the last 20 years. And so there's been a lot of wealth creation at these endowments and pensions and family offices. And they need to put it somewhere. And they want to keep you know, chasing the high returns for some portion of their um, uh, their asset, their, their capital base. So they have allocation strategies that basically say, we're going to put 8% into alternatives, and 3% of that is going to be VC. And they go around looking for where to put that 3%. And the number of firms, which I don't have that chart, unfortunately, but has been going down every year as well. Uh, that number I mentioned that's, uh, that's uh, um, around 800 and something, uh, that is a, that's probably half of what it was uh, during the boom years. 
Uh, so there are fewer firms. There's interest from these LPs in concentrating it into, into fewer ones that are larger um, because they have so much money to put to work uh, that the supply-demand equation between the limited partners and the uh, general partner, which is the venture capital firm, is such that that doesn't get pushed down. You might argue, well, why don't new entrants come in and say, hey, we'll do it for 1%. Um, and uh, it's sort of like, you know, I had a quote from, from one of my partners at uh, my last fund, that, you know, there, there are three things I don't want to get, uh, that I don't want to, you know, shop for based on price. Uh, and those are, you know, dentistry, brain surgery, and sushi. You know, this is probably another one of those uh, where, where you're not necessarily looking for a deal. You're looking for uh, competent operators. And again, if you're talking about, you know, if you're chasing 35% returns, the difference of 1% on that management fee, you know, which changes it from 35 to 34 uh, or 35 to 36, doesn't really move the dial on that um, decision process. But it's a very good question. Um, the reality is that, uh, that firms with franchises can get away with it, such that uh, the, you know, the management fee supports a wealth creation for the partners. So I didn't get to this slide, uh, which is my last one, that what I think the benefits are of these, of these smaller funds that uh, deploy less capital into capital efficient businesses. Uh, one thing is, which I described a little bit, you have closer alignment with entrepreneurs, which means you know, if my basis is lower uh, and there's less money in the company, that $40 million exit I described you know, might be exciting for the entrepreneur, and it's also pretty exciting for me. So we're on the same page, we're moving forward together, and outcomes that a bigger VC who put in more money at a higher valuation wouldn't consider are ones that we can go after uh, and all declare victory. Um, I described that lower probability of company failures. If you keep your burn rate lower because you've raised less money, uh, you don't have to sort of keep feeding that beast. You know, the, these companies, the reason startups need venture capital in the first place is because they have to spend money before they can actually earn revenue. You got to build a product. I'm sure you guys all, this is, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, if you take in a big Series A round or a big Series B round before you're in revenue, you're going to spend it. Yeah, your investor, who's now your board member, who's you know sort of uh, uh, oversees the strategy of the business and approves the annual operating budget, is not expecting to put ten million dollars into the company and then have it sit there in the bank account, never get used. They expect you to go and hire people, uh, buy materials, build stuff, contract vendors uh, to accelerate the rate of growth or increase the prospects of accelerated growth. So what happens if you spent all that money and, and gosh, you missed your, your product market fit a little bit? Uh, and you, know, you need to cycle back around, but all of a sudden you've got all these people uh, and you've got this burn rate and, before, and you, know, you spent most of it before you realize that, gosh, we're a little off center here. We need to revise our strategy and you know, go over here instead of going here. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's sort of a restart and you need more money and that's when entrepreneurs get washed out. Um, so lower probability of company failures. Like I said, a $60 million exit is a big win for everybody. Uh, and it's, it's nice to know that the average exit, uh, that all I have to do is hit the average to have industry leading returns. That makes me feel pretty good. Um, good prospects for superior investor returns. Uh, same thing. Uh, I win when my LPs win. And finally, the, this point, closer alignment with my limited partners, which is exactly the point you're making. Uh, in the back there, which is, you know, nobody gets rich on management fees when you have, call it 10, 15 million dollars under management per partner. Um, uh, I'm making less as a co-founder and general partner of this fund than I was as an associate at, in investment banking right out of business school. Uh, but I have a lot more upside. Uh, and so I'm, you know, I'm close alignment with my investors. I win when they win, which makes me feel pretty good. And, Makes me excited to come to work every day. Other questions? Yes. Sure. Um, I, can, I have opinions. I don't know why. Um, 
First of all, LA's, uh, Southern California's, okay, I've got a few, just a few minutes. Uh, Southern California's big. Uh, you know, there's, there's 20 million people or something like that in Southern California as compared to 3 million in, San, in the Bay Area. I don't know if those are the exact numbers. Um, there are, you know, in order of magnitude, more businesses. Uh, and, but traditionally, it's been the entertainment industry and sort of middle market. Uh, and so it's, it is uh, just lately that a spirit of entrepreneurship and an orientation to these types of companies has come to Southern California. That's largely driven, I would say, by the convergence of technology and media and entertainment that was sort of perspective during the initial years of the internet, which is real now. I mean, now you really do see the CEO of Google and the CEO of CBS on, on the stage together at CES. Uh, you know, those, those worlds really have converged. You know, companies like Fox and Viacom, CBS, NBC, Universal, really are exit prospects. They buy internet companies. They run internet companies very successfully. Uh, and the other thing is there's been a generation of successes. And so now you have a cadre of experienced operators who are going out to do it again. You know, examples right here in Santa Barbara, uh, Expert City was a great uh, a company that sold to Citrix for $230 million. It now employs 700 people here in Santa Barbara. Um, FastClick uh, was another one, uh, went public, sold to ValueClick. CallWave went public here. Computer Motion went public, sold to Intuitive Surgical. The business of Intuitive Surgical was the business of Computer Motion. It's, in, it's I think, a $15 billion business right now. Unfortunately, it's not here in Santa Barbara anymore. Uh, and then down in Southern California, video gaming, uh, the center of the world of video gaming is LA. Um, so companies like uh, EA, Activision, Jamdat down there did great, and now those, those folks are going out to do it again. Overture, paid, uh, the company that pioneered paid search, which is essentially what Google makes all its money on, uh, was Overture, which was bought by Yahoo, which was in Pasadena. Uh, Yahoo did Southern California a tremendous favor by leaving it in Southern California. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's been a whole a generation of, of operators that came out of Overture and have started new and exciting businesses. Uh, comparison shopping engines, Shopzilla, uh, Price Grabber, uh, Smarter.com uh, are all Southern California companies, uh, all terrific successes that sold for hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's just, you know, it's, it took a while, but it's developed. Yes? Uh, does it make sense for early stage investors to quit like on the next stage of investment when they see like, oh, too much money coming in and they think that you just overvalued the company and just, hey, let's get the money and get out? It's a really tough problem. Um, as a small fund, oh, sure, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the question was if you're an early stage investor and a follow on financing occurs that's really big, what do you do? Is that a good, good summary. Um, it's frustrating when a company that's doing well, uh, we, I've got a company here that, that in, in, in Santa Barbara that you know, maybe needed to do a $5 million financing. Company is doing phenomenally well, great operating team, uh, you know, just hitting their plan month in, month out, uh, had tremendous interest, and they ended up raising $36 million. Uh, and so that's you know, $36 million of dilution, $36 million of liquidation preference, which means that money gets paid out before anyone else gets any money. Um, and, and so it's, it's frustrating. It's a, it's a, you know, the fear is that it's a false victory. Um, the hope is that they take that money, they have uh, you know, NPV positive uses for it, meaning they take each of those dollars and they turn those into $5 each. Uh, and, and we all win from that bigger round. Yeah, but, but it increases the risk profile of the company, doesn't it? Yeah, but why don't you quit like an early investor? You see too much money coming in, you know, it's expected it does work, it will not work out. Yeah. So I, just, I just take my part out or upper risk and leave. Sure, well, there, there, there's, uh, okay, so the, sorry, the question is, um, why not just cash out, uh, sell into the, into the round and, uh, and move on. Well, one of the things is that you often can't. Um, there is not a, a, a liquid public market for these securities. So the buyer of these shares, wh 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 whose main objective is to put money into the company for growth, has to agree to take out some existing investors. Typically, that's a negative signal to them. 
right? I'm an investor already. I know more about the company than they do. If I want to sell, that's kind of a bad sign. Uh, and so that is very uncommon. Uh, the other reason is that this new investor is coming in and expecting to get, you know, a 5 to 10x on their money. So, gosh, well, why not roll the dice and go for that big return? Uh, and then the third phenomenon uh, is, uh, again, that agency issue again, whereby a VC gets compensated on excess return rather than total return. So, you know, if I'm looking at the difference between a sure 2x in 12 months versus the prospect for a 10x that's much riskier in five years, well, the 2x, 1x of it goes back to the investor first, so all I get is a piece of 1x as opposed to a piece of 9x. So I'm, I'm motivated to stay in, and that's another place where there may be um, misalignment between the LP, the one, the investors, and uh, and the GP, the manager of the fund. It's a very good question, and and it's it's something that that we struggle with. And the you know as a small fund, the challenge is to find other like-minded investors, either co-invest with on my A round, or to be follow-on investors in subsequent rounds. So there's a there's an active effort on funds like mine to find other funds like mine and network and make sure we know each other and pass deals together, share deals. In. So if you are got a medical device and you're going to a VC that has no interest in investing in medical device companies, that, that's another rookie mistake that we see a lot out there. Absolutely. And um, so research what the VC that you're going to talk to, what they've invested in the past, and make sure that they're, whether it's software, internet, digital media, the like. Yeah. E every venture capital firm has a website. We broadcast what we're looking for because we want it to come to us. So uh, absolutely make sure you do your homework on the individual firm that you're talking about and even the individual partner that you're looking at because at most firms there is a delineation of responsibility by sector. So uh, this partner might be the digital media guy, this partner is the software guy, this partner is the semiconductor guy. This guy, this partner is the biotech guy. This partner is the is the med devices guy, uh, or gal. Sorry about that. Uh, so so make sure you're you're targeting the right person and talking to the right person. Um, and then you know, uh, be polite and be persistent, I guess, and 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 try and strike a good balance between those two things. Um, there is, and I'm. This is a, it's an interesting job because there is so much more that I could do in a day than I have time to do. So there is a, there's a triage uh, exercise every day where I get to do 10% of the things that I'd like to do. And that's not, that's not self-important. There's just a lot of different, you know, things to, to do, learn, think about. It's, it's part of the reason this job is so wonderful is because if, if uh, all I look at is new ideas all the time. And, and uh, I have to spend a lot of time trying to learn about things after it's been presented to me. So uh, there's an awful lot to do in a day. Uh, and so if a VC doesn't get back to you promptly, it, it's not necessarily because they're not interested. Uh, uh, it's not necessarily because they're a jerk, though they might be. Um, uh, it might just be because they haven't had time. Uh, and so there's absolutely nothing wrong with following up um, you know, a week or two after your initial uh, connection, uh, just to remind them that uh, that you'd still be very interested to chat with them. Jim, you talked about uh, ideas and you talked about the financials. Could you just touch on the team aspect? What are you looking for in the people across the desk from you? Uh, um, you're looking for everything. You know, the the, the ideal is. Um, Uh, a passionate, complete team uh, with domain expertise and proven execution expertise, uh, who's also hungry. So there's a you know there's a, there's an inherent conflict there uh, because if you've done it before and been successful, uh, you know you might be perfectly happy to uh, 
go to Starbucks in the morning, read your coffee, go for a walk, not work so hard. Uh, it is actually a challenge of, of uh, investing locally here in Santa Barbara because there are a tremendous number of people who've had great success elsewhere and moved here for lifestyle reasons. Um, but they don't really want a full-time job. So it's a great place to get uh, advisors. It's a tough place to hire a team. Um, I've actually developed a, a, a matrix uh, as, an, as an X strategy consultant. I'm obligated to throw out two by two matrices every once in a while. Um, and uh, on one axis is the, uh, is the pedigree of the team. And on the other axis, axis is the uh, progress that the company has already made. Um, what that means is if I have a very experienced team at pure startup mode, I'll consider it. If I have a very inexperienced team at pure startup mode, I typically won't consider it. If I have an inexperienced team, meaning you know, not much of a track record before this experience, that's already making it happen, I'll consider it. Um, so the, the advice there that, that, is, that is inherent in that is if you don't have a track record, if this is your first opportunity, don't wait to get money to get started. You know, the beauty of this era, and I didn't, I didn't do a good job covering it in my presentation, uh, the beauty of where we are right now is that it's never been cheaper to launch and build a business. Uh, that's another one of the dynamics that we're taking advantage of. It has never been cheaper to launch and build a business. Uh, think about software businesses, think about internet businesses. The entire stack that you're building this business on is open source. Uh, and computing power is just phenomenally cheap. Uh, you can start a business and show user traction uh, on nights and weekends without any capital at all. You know, literally a couple thousand bucks. Uh, and so, you know, if you're a first timer, you know, take a risk, go do it, go start doing it. And instead of showing me idea, an idea, show me progress. Thank you very much. Thank you.